I welcome you to our online service today. I trust that you'll join us for a time of worship and not just simply watch the service, which I know at times can be a temptation when we watch from our homes, but really the design of these services is that we hope that you are able to worship together with us, even though we may not be present in the same building, but we can still worship together. Pastor Randy is going to be speaking today about the incredible record of God's preparation for the coming of Jesus. It's good for us to give thought to the majesty of our Lord and Savior. And so I'm going to read for us Psalm chapter 8 as a call to worship. It reads as follows. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All flocks and herds, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Dear Lord, please accept our worship and our praise of you today. We want to express our, our thanks throughout this service today through the spoken word as well as through song. May you be glorified and honored in all that we say and do. We pray this in your name. Amen. I've got a number of announcements this morning, or today. Don't know exactly when you're watching this. So the first is that our junior and senior youth, you'll see some pictures of them coming up on the screen. These are some photos of some of the participants and, uh, and some of the prize winners as well. Junior and senior youth this last week did a scavenger hunt over a number of days. And uh, there were, we were trying to encourage them to go out with a parent to enjoy um, some of these clues and try to figure some things out. So uh, we hope that they had a good time. And here's just a few pictures um, of, of some of the activities and some of the things that they did as part of that scavenger hunt. I, I also want to encourage you to please check our weekly bulletin online for an updated list of positions um, that we are either looking to fill in a, in a variety of committees and also the nominees that have agreed to let their names stand, at least till this date. Let's continue to be in prayer for all of the positions and for wisdom as we wait our annual general meeting when the public health guidelines allow us uh, to meet in person. Winkler Bible Camp invites you to bring your sweetheart to a drive-in Valentine's fundraising event on February 12th, 13th, and 14th. Uh, they're going to be providing snacks and an entertaining 40-minute program up on the big screen. Tickets are $30 per couple, and there'll be a free will offering that's going to be taken to further support the work of Winkler Bible Camp. To book your spot, either uh, purchase, uh, purchase that on their website or call their office. Another announcement, the Ladies Bible Study is going to be meeting on Zoom again this Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, please contact Judy Gisleson if you'd like more information about that. Um, the other announcement that I wanted to make as well is that the Ministry 1613 is organizing a fundraiser to help provide some money for Amanda and Amelia Weeb, uh, missionaries in Mexico. Uh, the funds raised are going to help to cover some of their personal costs as well as they reach out to the youth and the children of areas of their ministry. Um, there's a, a lengthy announcement in our bulletin that gives all kinds of details, but in short, uh, this is a, uh, a fundraiser in which we're asking you to order pizzas, I know we're just coming off of the end of, of pizza week here in Winkler, so maybe you just need one more pizza yet. Um, so uh, those pizzas are going to be available hot and ready for pickup uh, on February 1st, 2nd, and 3rd um, from 12 o'clock till 1 o'clock for lunch, or you can also pick up from 5 till 6 o'clock at the Pizza Hut in Winkler. And the cost is going to be $20 each, $10 of which will uh, go towards, uh, of each pizza sold is going to go towards helping Amanda and Amelia. So uh, today is the last day for you to place your orders. Um, so please check out the detailed information uh, about 
you know, what kind of pizza you can order, how to place the order, uh, donation receipts, all the rest of that information. That's all available on our church website at ourbethelchurch.com. And just click under the bulletin for this Sunday and all the information will be there. So at this time, I invite you to join us in a time of worship through song.
As we prepare for our prayer time today, I'd like to share a note with you from myself and Pastor Mark, Evan Taves, our council chair, and Gerald Teeson, our ministerial chair. We have talked and, and visited with various ones from our church family, and we are very aware that the public health order restrictions have limited our ability for meeting as part of being the church community. And like you, we look forward to the day when we can meet in person. We continue to be committed to provide with ministerial and counsel and some active volunteers the best possible care through ongoing contacts, through the online worship services such as this one, and in the new effort for some teaching for our children. We want everyone to be healthy physically and mentally as well as spiritually. We would encourage that there be patience and respect for our local, provincial, and national leaders. The scriptures call us to pray for those who lead us. We also appreciate your continued prayers and support uh, as church leadership. And if you have questions and concerns, please talk to us. We would encourage you to consider contacting the various levels of leadership in our church and government to be a voice of appreciation, of encouragement, of advice, and or concern. Let's remember to always do that in the spirit of love and respect as we carry forth the banner of Jesus Christ. We are still his church in this unusual time. We are part of the community, and in the name of Christ Jesus, we need to help each other to come through this time in God's grace and with a new appreciation for what it means to be his church in every season. As we prepare for prayer, we're also going to listen to, to a, another report by Alan Peters uh, from Brandon. Hey Bethel, so happy to be with you again this morning for my last uh, time at this uh, for this month. Um, here, excited to kind of show you some of the progress in our building. Uh, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a walkthrough, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the different things that you're seeing um, when we get to kind of the end of the tour. Uh, if you get a little bit dizzy from uh, fast motion, uh, just be ready for that right now. standing here in our common room on the third floor here at Blue Lions, which is going to be the home of the community building that happens with common spaces. So in each of our two buildings here, we have seven apartments that will be dedicated to uh, common spaces uh, where we'll have young people move in that have been struggling with addictions, have gone through treatment or connected with peer support groups and are looking for a place to uh, have safe and secure dry housing for a chance to continue to work on everything from life skills to faith journey to accountability and um, connecting in community and learning uh, about uh, themselves and what's next. Uh, this common room is gonna be um, the place where a lot of that happens, um, but, but so much of it just starts with having a warm, clean, safe, dry place to live and to, to launch out of. So I'm excited um, for this to start here in the, in the next, um, month or so and as we get ready I would just ask that you guys would just keep myself, uh, my team in your prayers that you would um, just uh, ask uh, and continue to be asking along with us for wisdom and guidance that we would be able to meet with the right young people that need this space and that we would be able to build the connections that we need to in the community and um, as this goes forward um, just the grace to continue to, to work together to learn and to um, yeah 
uh, support young people because that's what we love to do and, and we know Jesus has just such an incredible desire to see them meet him and to um, just gain victory in their life um, over so many um, things whether it's addiction or or other things so we're excited thank you so much for um, partnering with me as a missionary uh, Bethel and I look forward to being able to connect with you again one day in person bye now I invite you to join me for a time of prayer together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to give you praise and thanks that in the midst of, of all of the changes that we've seen in the world and in society around us, that uh, your word still goes out clearly. Lord, we want to thank you for the ministry of, of Alan as, uh, and through the work at Youth for Christ, um, through the common places. Thank you that construction continues, and we pray that construction will continue to go well we also pray that as they give discernment and wisdom to uh, those that are going to be involved in that housing and uh, all of their staffing and volunteers and so on, um, just give them wisdom, Lord, as, uh, as they are, are nearing a start date to being able to reach out in, with this program to some of, of the young people in that area. Give them joy uh, and unity, and, uh, and hopefully they can finish off all of the building projects as planned. Um, so that uh, they can have an amazing ministry to help uh, the young people dealing with addictions and other things in their area. Lord, we also want to thank you um, for all that you continue to do for us. Lord, you've blessed us in incredible ways. And even though at na right now we find it difficult that we're not meeting together as a family of believers here in the church, we want to thank you for the freedoms that we do have. And Lord, we, we want to thank you that we can connect with loved ones and, uh, and we've got a little bit more personal connection uh, with, some, with some of those people due to uh, some of the restrictions being lifted a little bit recently. So thank you for that. Help us to be thankful for what we do have and uh, continue to lift up our, our leadership in prayer as they continue to make um, decisions. Lord, we do want to pray for wisdom and discernment for us as a church body as well. Um, as we uh, give thought to the various different positions on committees and so on, um, and for the nominating committee, uh, Lord, we pray again for a spirit of unity and uh, as we are wanting the right people to be involved in the various ministries of this church so that your work can go out clearly, creatively, and effectively to this community. Thank you for all those that have been willing to let their names stand and that are serving on various committees and for those that are considering um, letting their names stand uh, going, into this next, uh, going into this next year as well. Lord, we also want to lift up those that are dealing with health issues. Lord, we pray for healing for those that are dealing with, uh, with, with sickness and illness. Um, we pray, Lord, that they would have a sense of peace and of calm in the midst of, of what they're going through. And I pray that we as a church would continue to lift up and support them through prayer and contacts. Um, help them know that they are loved and cared for. Lord, we pray that you would give a sense of calmness and peace to those who are battling with anxiety, depression, loneliness uh, during this time of being away from loved ones as well. Lord, we want to be a clear witness for you. So I pray, Lord, that your word would continue to go clearly um, from us as a body of believers, even though we're not gathering together, but uh, under the banner of, uh, of Bethel Church, but more importantly, the banner of you, Christ. Uh, we pray, Lord, that that we would be accurate representatives of yours and reach out in love and care and concern to those around us. May your word continue to go boldly and clearly, not only through this service, but through how we live each and every one of our lives as well. May we continue to be a living testimony for you. We pray this in your all-powerful name. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. And I hope you are all well and finding good ways uh, to help at home and to keep busy. What's that? You, are you helping at home? You are? That's great. You know, it's nice when the temperatures are milder and we can go outside to play, and I hope you've had a little opportunity to do that this weekend. The Awana and Sunday School teachers miss their time with you, and although we cannot offer Awana and Sunday School yet, we can offer you a special program on YouTube, and it can also be found at our church website. Uh, there will be a brief link in the top right corner of the screen. If needed, your family can stop the video, go back to the link, and click on it to watch the children's feature. Or you can go to the church website and select Labora Story. 
So I'd like to take a moment to pray with you and for all the children. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for these children who are learning about loving you. Thank you for their moms and their dads who care for them and teach them every day. Help the children to listen carefully for the lessons they can learn and then practice. We ask for your safety and protection for all the children and their families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading this morning, I'd invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 10 to 12. 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 10 to 12, which reads as follows. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Thus far the reading of God's word. This morning, I feel very privileged to be able to share with you from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12. This section points to the timeless foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes as Christians, we feel a little uncertain of the role of the Old Testament for our lives today. We love the parts that we understand 
and we teach them to our children, but there are some sections that we may not understand and we may also be uncertain of how they square up with the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. We will not be able to unravel all of those questions here this morning. We sometimes have opportunity to do that in our adult Sunday school classes. But as we read in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12, we clearly read that God was using the prophets and writers of the Old Testament to help point the way to the Messiah, Jesus, who would be revealed in the time of the New Testament. In the previous verses of this opening chapter, Peter has written that in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This living hope of salvation that gives us strength and guidance in everyday life is rooted in the character of God and in the record of his communication and preparation which we find in the Old Testament. When Jesus referred to the scriptures, he was talking about the Old Testament because that was all that was written at that time. Jesus Jesus often quoted the Old Testament as an authority and an explanation for why he spoke or acted as he did. God had inspired the writing of the Old Testament, and now through Jesus and later the apostles was explaining the Old Testament to illustrate the new life God has invited all of us to discover in Jesus Christ. You know, in my personal life, I enjoy history, and I have been fascinated in one way or another to discover information about my genealogy, where my family roots come from, and what that might indicate. And I now have some access to online information that helps me to trace my family heritage. What I have discovered recently has been fascinating and beyond my imagination. The other day I found the birth certificate for one of my grandmothers. I could even read who her doctor was. And I discovered that one of my great great-grandfathers, or was it my great-great-great-grandfather, had come from an island in the Inner Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland on the Isle of Mull. But one thing I do not have, with all this information, I do not have access to any diaries from any of these ancestors who made the decision to come to North America. What was their trip like? Why did they come? What hope was guiding them? In 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12, it tells us that there is a written record of the plan of God for our salvation. You could say that it is a record of our roots, and God is the author. God made sure that this plan would be recorded in advance by godly people for our benefit. Whom did God use to record these things? Peter called them prophets. Concerning this salvation, verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care. These prophets were speaking and writing to people of their time. They were guided by God's Holy Spirit, which is mentioned in verse 11. Peter also brings up this important fact in 2 Peter chapter 1. I'd like to read that for you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This act of the Spirit speaking to and through the prophets is called inspiration in our teaching from, about the Scriptures. We know that the Old Testament prophets were not being careless with what they declared and what they recorded. In fact, being a prophet was normally a very challenging uh, role in their day. It was not always appreciated by the people around them. You can read that in the Old Testament. There were others in their society who falsely said what the king wanted to hear or what the people wanted to hear. God's prophets were moved by God's spirit and committed to integrity. The NIV states that they searched intently and with the greatest care. 
How intently and exhaustively did they study to know the truth and seek to know the truth that God was revealing? I'd like to take a few minutes to consider with you Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and David. The book of Daniel is a wonderful book to study because it is a book that records real events from his day and location, but it also points to the times we are living in and beyond. In Daniel 8, he describes a vision which God gave to him. And then in chapter 8, verses 15 to 18, we read this. I'd like to read it for you from Daniel chapter 8, verses 15 to 18. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And as he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. And some explanation, after some explanation of the vision, it, it continues. And then we read this in verse 26 and 27. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. And then he says this about his own experience physically and emotionally. He says, I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. The reception of these prophecies and the eagerness to correctly understand them was physically and emotionally consuming. Daniel did not just listen to God's Spirit speaking to him. He also checked other sources. We read that as we continue, read that as we continue in Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3. One of the sources was the writing of the prophet Jeremiah. So listen again, Daniel 9, verse 1 to 3. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord, given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. And I'm using these to illustrate the, the, the cost and also the diligence that these prophets had. Here is Daniel reading from the writings of Jeremiah and trying to understand the things that God has given him to know and to record. As we think of the foretelling and the declaring of salvation, all those important uh, matters through the prophets, we are also reminded of Isaiah, who spoke to the needs of his day by God's direction and also spoke of the very real details of what God's son would experience as the suffering servant and as the coming king. The book of Isaiah has been described as the fifth gospel. You can lead someone to personal faith in Jesus Christ through the study of Isaiah alone. In chapters 52 to 56, they stand out among those chapters. You cannot read Isaiah 52 and 53 without reading about the crucifixion of Christ which would not yet happen for 700 years. You cannot read Isaiah 55 and 56 without reading about the salvation God was offering through his servant to all, Jew and Gentile alike. I will also briefly mention David. We did a teaching series about David. We know he was not perfect, a perfect man, but God also spoke to him and through him. Some of this we find in the Psalms that he recorded. And one example is Psalm 22, which graphically describes Jesus' experience on the cross centuries before it happened, including some of the words he, that, that, that would be spoken at the cross. Jesus spoke to the disciples about these prophets as they considered the power of God that was at work in Jesus' day. And for that, I'm going to give you an example from Luke, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. Luke 10, 23 and 24. Jesus has, been, has, has sent the disciples out to go and 
learn about how to present his message in the communities and in the villages, and they come back together, and they're giving a report, and then Jesus says this. He turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You can also find the uh, parallel reference to that in Matthew 13. I've highlighted these Old Testament windows to the past so that we can more fully appreciate what Peter is writing in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Let's read that again. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was active in guiding these prophets. The sufferings of the Messiah would include the hatred of people toward him, the betrayal by his friend, being forsaken and abandoned by all of his disciples for at least a brief time, and the scourging and the physical experience of the crucifixion. The glories would include the transfiguration of Jesus, an event which Peter witnessed and, and mentions again in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. The, glory is a, of con, uh, or the concept of glory is a significant concept in Peter's writing. The glories would also include his resurrection, his coming return, and his final reign. The prophets knew about these things to some degree, but I think we can correctly conclude from this statement in Peter that they would have wanted to be present for those future events if they could, or at least to know more about the when and the how. What was this going to look like, and what was it going to sound like? In verse 12, it states, it was revealed to them, these prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. We need to know, and we can reinforce in this text today, that the gospel is God's timeless message to the present age. Verse 12. You know, when the Holy Spirit was introduced and the church was born on the day of Pentecost, which we find record of in Acts chapter 2, Peter and the apostles had opportunity to present the message of Christ to the citizens of the world who had gathered at Jerusalem. Their message was not just repent and be saved. Peter quoted the words God had given to the prophets as part of the defense and explanation for what was happening and why it was happening. In that message at Pentecost, references to the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Hosea, Micah, and several psalms all appear in the presentation to the people. The gospel message has been personally prepared by God for us to know and believe. And the persons who are responsible for helping you and me to know and begin to understand that gospel invitation were passing on the heritage of faith that had been faithfully communicated to and through the prophets of old for our benefit. Peter describes them this way. They were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Can we draw from this statement that sharing the message of salvation through Jesus is an unselfish act? We take the time to tell others what we have learned and experienced so that they can also benefit from it. A few years ago, I attended a conference at Regent College, which is a theological teaching center on the campus of the University of British Columbia. The most terrifying part of that trip for this prairie boy was <laughs> going to be that I knew nobody who might be there, and I would be entirely dependent on public transit, plane, light rail, and buses to get to my destination. No car keys anywhere. 
I called or communicated with someone at the registration office and they gave me very clear directions for how to get from the Vancouver airport to my destination. And I did get a little confused at one transfer point and a visitor to the city gladly helped me on the way and I arrived safely at my destination. There was a path to get there and people who had traveled it pointed to me to, to what I needed to know. You know, the people who presented the gospel to you and me were simply carrying on God's plan for faithful messengers, empowered by the Spirit to tell us the timeless message of our need and of God's provision for our forgiveness through Jesus. And it is a living hope that transforms who we are even as we look for better days. If you have never expressed to God your need for his living hope to transform you, today is the right day to do that. You know by now that I like poetry and hymns can be like poetry. I do love other songs of worship, but hymns can be like poetry. And the hymn Whiter Than Snow illustrates our humble submission to God through his Son in salvation. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want you forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Which is a a symbol of forgiveness from Psalm 51.7. The second verse says, Lord Jesus, you see that I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. If that song expresses what you need to experience, I would encourage you to get on your knees before God and to thank Him for His love and care for you and for the message of forgiveness and a living and continuing hope that He offers to each one of us through Jesus alone. This is not a new message. This has always been God's message, but some of the messengers are found in the time of the Old Testament. And we have the great privilege to be part of the Lord's Church today and to live in the time when this message is more fully revealed. It is not only our privilege to know this message personally, as we have opportunity, we should pass on the message to others. A couple of illustrations that might help us. Someone has said that sharing the gospel with others is like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. If you were hungry and your need had been met, wouldn't you be ready to tell somebody else who needed it? needed to know where that source was. Sharing the message of salvation through Jesus has also been compared to the question of what would we do if a bridge was washed out, fallen or not there, and you saw someone racing towards that passage? If you saw someone traveling to that bridge where that bridge was, you knew there was no safe way to cross in the path they were taking, would you not want to stop them And help them turn to go to the route that was safe and that was recommended. One day, two or three winters ago, I I was at the Winkler Post Office on a cold, windy day. And I saw a senior citizen, a dear lady who I actually knew, knew her. She was on the south side of Mountain Avenue wanting to cross to over by the post office. There was a lot of traffic coming and going, and this wind, I was afraid the wind was going to blow her over. She was was just that small and tiny, and the wind was so strong. And I saw her there, and I didn't call her. I didn't want to alarm her or alert her. I just walked across, and I said, Mary, can I escort you across the street? And so she took my arm, and we walked together from the one side of the street to the other so that she could get safely to the other side. That is what we do when we are inviting people to know Jesus Christ and what he has offered. Safe passage to our destination, the destination that he would have for us. 
God has preserved this message through the past and to the present so that we could experience the living hope that only he provides and tells others and, and, and tell others where and how to find this living hope also. We should not just be consumers of the message. We need to be distributors of his message. If our church is just consuming the gospel and celebrating what we know, then we miss the point. We need to be distributors looking for every possible way to pass on to others what we have been learning and experiencing by God's grace and in his power. There is a final comment made by Peter in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He writes, Even angels long to look into these things. You know, many of us do not have a great knowledge of angels. We don't usually cover it in detail in our sermons. I do try to offer some core facts in our discipleship class about angels. Angels are servants of God. They do not draw attention to themselves. We do not become angels when we die. The Bible says nothing about salvation for angels. They are servants of God on his service and care for us and uh, as part of the heavenly business. Angels learn about what salvation is when they see the grace of God at work in our lives. Let me say that again. Angels learn about what salvation is when they see the grace of God at work in our lives. The term used here is that they long to look into these things. Just like when we stoop down to look closely at something of special interest. And for me these days, that would be like the fine print in the grocery aisles. (laughs) The, uh, we, we, we stoop down to look and see, is that really what it says? Or if you tried to read a medicine bottle lately, the fine print on, uh, on uh, over-the-counter meds, uh, you go, wow, mm, let's see, what, how am I going to read that? They stooped down to look closely at something of special interest. In 1 Corinthians 4, 9 and in Ephesians 3, 10, both give small insight into the education plan that God has for angels. But we'll leave that for another day. Both the prophets and the angels marveled at what God was planning and did bring about for us in his plan for Christ to be our sacrifice and our Savior. God's truth has been prophesied, preserved, presented, and made available for us to know and to live by. I mentioned family trees before. Family trees, I find, to be very interesting things at least for me, but far more fascinating and fulfilling is the knowledge that God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus and offers us a living hope, not a dead faith, and not just a bunch of historical facts. I would like to encourage you to a homework assignment for this day or this week. It could be today, and it might be great if it was today. It can be a real and meaningful time if you have children at home to share it with them and to do it even just as adults together in your home. Please take time to describe to each other in simple terms how you came to know and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who helped you to that moment of understanding? What Bible verses stand out in your memory as encouraging to you to trust in God? Moms and dads, this is a perfect opportunity to explain or review in terms your children understand what it means to trust in Jesus. We could also take time to pray as a household and give thanks for the faithful messengers whom God used to guide us to faith. If you have heard this message and you need some help to think through what it means to be certain that you have, you have experienced, also experienced the new life Peter is writing about, please call me or email me so that we can find time to talk together about these important matters. Or maybe you have a friend whom you trust who loves Jesus and you can have that conversation with them. I'd like to read for you 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12 again says, concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. 
It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. I'd like to invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to understand in some ways how the Old and New Testament come together. The Old Testament provided a record pointing forward to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Peter was declaring and acknowledging how you have been communicating and revealing yourself in various stages and ways in the past for our present. And we thank you that we can know about these things. We thank you for the preservation and the illumination and the stimulation that this can be uh, for each one of us as we, re we respect the word you've given to us. Help us to be faithful in understanding the message that you've given to us. Help us to be eager not only to know it, to experience it, but to pass it on to others who need help to cross safely. We ask for your hand upon us. We thank you for your faithfulness to our local church and help us to be a light and a testimony to the community around us. And this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
As a closing reading from the scripture today, I'd like to uh, present to you the doxology. It's a closing expression of praise to God found in the middle of the book of Romans in, uh, verse, or in chapter 11, beginning at verse 33. Romans 11, to 30, uh, 33 to 36. This is our doxology for today, a song of praise. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we ask for your hand of safety upon us as families. Give us that courage to have the conversations together about what it means to know Jesus as our Savior and to talk about how that happened in our life and uh, the, the ways that you are helping us to grow. Help us to be an encouragement to one another. Help us to reach out to others around us who still need to hear it. And we thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.